Today is 29 September 2004. I'm here at the Veterans Hospital as a volunteer to interview a World War II member, Mr. Manuel Pacheco. We also have Mr. James Coughlin as a video photographer. Mr. Pacheco. Yes. Can you explain where you lived and how you got into the military? Where I lived before the, I entered the service. I uh, lived in a little town called Riverbank, California. And, um, and what year was that? That was in 1943. And uh, I had I wanted to be an aerial gunner. And so, uh, but uh, my dad said, well, I need help. Uh, so I worked in the farms, and so I stayed a little bit longer until the draft come by, and, and I was drafted, which is okay. So I um, ended up going to North Carolina for training, and it was at night. And I thought, I heard the planes, I heard planes overhead at night, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be an aerial gunner. Turns out to be that was Airborne Division instead of the Air Force. So the, the fellows start telling me, hey, this is an airborne division. Uh, you want to volunteer for paratroopers? I said, well, I wanted to be an aerial gunner. He said, well, there's no such thing around here. You are going to uh, be a glider man or you're going to be a, a paratrooper. And I said, and they said, it's telling me, you know, they said $50 more a month. Now, that, that's what got me into the $50 more a month. So I went ahead and uh, volunteered for, for a paratrooper. As we got trained, uh, I started telling them what I used to do, you know, the officers at home, what I did. And I said, well, me and my dad, um, we uh, chop wood and we cut wood, firewood, for, and, and uh, we sell it. And then I said, uh, my dad used to use dynamite uh, to blow these great big trees, blow them apart. And so they got the idea that maybe I should be a demolition man, which is what I turned out to be. A demolition man, they call it demolition expert. But anyway, I did enjoy working with explosives. And uh, uh, besides the explosive, there was this thing about uh, building things, you know, and as an engineer. And so I'll tell you what, I don't know how many others, but I did kind of enjoy my tour in the Army. And I even cried when the war was over because I was, had bonded with all these men. And uh, I said, well, I won't see these guys anymore. As it happens, out of all the men, I ended up um, going home after I was separated from the Army uh, on the bus with, uh, with uh, Lynn Rose, um, a, 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 a private first class also, and he was a demolition man also. So I went and they dropped me off in Modesto, California from, from, from Sacramento, and he went into Fresno where he lived. And um, that's uh, most of the, there's a lot of things happen in between. And, you know, the, from the time I was drafted until the time I was discharged. So I, um, I was on furlough in September of 1943. Uh, no, no, yeah, 43, yep, 43. And so I had a transfer in Kansas City, Missouri, so I could go on to North Carolina where we was taking training. And... Uh, I was looking for so somebody to talk to, and I saw these two young ladies. And uh, so I approached them, and I talked to them. And uh, one of them was really outgoing and very friendly, one of them was. The other one was real quiet and, and uh, more subdued. And, and uh, she appealed to me right away, which was my Mary. And so the picture that I have here is a picture of, of uh, me and her as we was uh, walking around Kansas City, Missouri, uh, as a reflection. Okay, yeah, and so we uh, got acquainted, and uh, I'm pretty sure you fell in love. Well, you know what it's like, and that's what happened to me. I fell in love, and I uh, could not um, get her out of my mind ever since that particular day, so, we wanted to go to the show, and so I said, I'll stay over and go AWOL, but I'll tell the MPs I missed my train. 
because there was millions of GIs meandering all over that Union Station in Kansas City, Missouri. So anyway, the, uh, the, the MP was real good about it. He said, yeah, sure. So he made me uh, an excuse so I can give it to my commander. And so that's what happened. You know, we stayed over and went to the show, and uh, I was so happy. And so finally, after riding back and forth all, the, all, all this time, that's why I'm saying that she's a great part of this story, is that um, when I was in New Guinea, I wrote, her, I wrote her a letter, and I said, I want to ask her to marry me. If, now, this is what happened. If she says no, I knew. I said, I'm going to die over here for sure. But she said yes. So I really took care of myself. And one of the things I did, uh, we was losing a lot of men with a, a disease called scrub typhus. Uh, this is a little, a little parasite that would get under your skin, would lay eggs, and then you would develop a real heavy or very high temperature. And the Army did not have a medication for this. So um, we lost a lot of men with this scrub typhus. So, but since she had said yes, I took care of myself. And they provided us a, 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 a bug, re, uh, insect repellent. And the thing about this insect repellent, that you put it on and it would burn. I mean, it kept the bugs out too, but they would burn, but I didn't care. I'm going to take care of myself. I used to say I was so happy that she had said yes. So what happens that uh, time goes by and uh, we are moved from New Guinea. This happened in New Guinea. From there, we made a landing in Leyte with General MacArthur. And then from there, we made a landing in the southern part of Luzon. And um, then that's when I found out why God had created flies. The flies were something else. They did the cleaning up of the dead flesh of these uh, Japanese and, and, and GIs too. And so uh, I got to learn in a lot of things besides knowing the value of flies. They would uh, lay the eggs on these dead bodies and of course they, they would hatch into maggots and they would, in one week, mind you, in one week, that, uh, that dead body would be nothing but bones. So they where, would, where is this at now? Uh, this is in Leyte. That's first, the that's first time I saw a dead, a dead, uh, a dead uh, Jap, Jap soldier. And uh, so uh, these are things I'm picking up as I'm going along. And, and uh, as an engineer, uh, my job was to um, uh, look for mines, deactivate the mines, and there was a lot of those. And that, that this is my job. Even the infantry would walk by and say, and they would tell me, I am glad I'm in the infantry uh, because, uh, you know, probing for these mines. H how about this? Uh, we got into a pasture that was something like a hundred acres or more, and the Japanese had mined it with 500-pound bombs. And so our job was to look for these 500-pound bombs that they had um, put into the ground. And so we done it. We done it. We just were well trained, you know. And we had a little wire that we probe into the ground, and we go along, and and we went ahead and. Uh, but when it came to um, looking for mines around the craters that was left there by the American bombs that was dropped on this area, mm -hmm. uh, that was something else. So I remember, really distinctly remember, uh, getting bored. And, uh, and with my trench, trenching tool, I, I was frustrated, I guess. I went ahead and, and hit the, uh, the ground with this trenching tool, and I missed that that uh, they, have, they have a little propeller. The bombs have a little propeller on the end. And um, the, the, when, this, when they drop the bomb, because the, 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 uh, the travel through the air uh, turns this little propeller that primes it and puts a needle inside of this primer that helps it to explode. So I missed that propeller by an inch. And I actually, I actually remember even right now, I remember uh, waiting for it to blow, and I could feel myself going up in the ground. I mean, up in the air, but I had missed it. You know, I was just like, "That's how close I come." Um, and uh, the other experience that I that sticks in my mind is that uh, we had some tanks. They had provided some tanks for us, and as we traveled uh, through um, Luzon, this is in Luzon, 
from uh, where we landed in the southern part uh, towards Manila. Uh, the Japs were moving out and we was moving in. And we had to go through a part of the um, of the area that was up in the mountains. So we come to a place in the mountains that had a lot of litter, uh, debris from the trees. And it looked like they had bombed that area. But it was camouflage. And there was also aerial bombs in that road. And one of the tanks got it. So then there we go. Then we had to, I, I remember crawling under the tank looking for a, a, an aerial bomb. And um, because we was trained and, and not even think about it now, I was not uh, afraid or, or I wasn't uh, scared or to say that uh, I don't want to do it. No, none of that. I went and probed and probed and sure enough, I found one. Mm -hmm. And so then I could let them know that the, the duck, this is, uh, this is underneath a duck, and not a tank, this is underneath a duck. No, it's under a tank, but they brought a duck with a winch. Uh, the, the tank moved out of the way, and of course by then I had all this dirt out of the, dug up out of around, around the bomb, and uh, I had taken the, the little propeller off with my wrench, my Japanese-made wrench, uh, for this bomb, a Japanese bomb, and I took the, the primer out, and they put a winch to it, and they pulled it out. It was not a very big bomb. This was not a 500-pound bomb. This, I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 pounds uh, bomb. But, but anyway, it would have really done some damage to the tank. And so uh, that was another one of my uh, highlights. You know, uh, you know, I give from one to ten to some of the battles that took place during World War II. Normandy would be ten. Um, the Bulge would be ten. And our encounter, because we as engineers, we, we wasn't supposed to, we was told not to be looking to, to kill any, any Japs, because our job was to, well, to do whatever it is we was trained to do, in my case, a demolition man. But um, um, this, another case that really is sticking in my mind is that uh, after I, they, we cleared the bombs out of that, then they put me to sweep and all that debris, and there was a, a junction a why? And every now and then the Japs would shoot at us with a machine gun. Hmm. And so then they had a, they put us to cleaning. And I, and I remember with a palm with a palm branch cleaning the debris off the road. And I and I could feel that Jap looking at me. But um, for I guess he didn't want to attract attention to himself or. Um, wanted to maybe he felt sorry for me i don't know but i didn't i did not get hurt he did not shoot at me so finally we got i got uh, past that uh, junction and so where he couldn't see me anymore so we kept on it was quite a way quite a long piece of road that we had a, a sweep and so the, the we got uh, that cleared up and uh, and then they they tried to look for the uh, for this chap with the, the machine gun nest but we was engineers and so they wouldn't do it they wouldn't let us do it and some of the guys wanted to get after him, you know, but they, uh, the officer said, no, he said, sure. Because, you know, if, they, if, if, if uh, like, say, if, if I go out there to look for this um, uh, machine gun nest and I got killed and they needed a demolition man, mm -hmm. I would not be able to do, <laughs> do them any good laying there. How and, long, excuse me, how long were you there? In that area? Mm -hmm. Well, it took about two hours to clean out that road. So, uh, yeah, how many days? Well, we was moving, so that we we was not there very long. We lost, uh, we lost, uh, I don't know, half a dozen guys as we moved because the Japanese were in spite what they call spider holes, and they would you know dig holes in the ground and then they cover themselves up, and then they would uh, when they at the proper time when they thought it was the right time where they they'd get out of that hole and, and shoot as many as they could, and they did uh, they did hit uh, some of our men. And I remember one, one guy that uh, got hit, and he fell, and he was, mama, mama, and he was flexing his fingers, and then he turned, he turned waxy. That's when I knew he had died. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then another case where my sergeant got killed, and um, he got hit in the groin, and he was hollering at the medical officer, am I going to die? Am I going to die? He had a big hole in his groin and his, um, his genitals where they had been torn out. 
and he said, am I going to die? And the officer said, no, you're going to be okay. But in about 10, 20 minutes while well, he was gone, but there was no way to put a tourniquet on him, you know. Mm. If you can visualize, imagine what it was like. So he bled to death. And uh, let's see what else was there. Oh, oh yeah, here's another one that's interesting, I think, that sticks in my mind. We had been sent to this little island, I forget the name of it, to uh, bring out all these wounded and the dead that we'd had. And uh, so then uh, what happens is that um, we ran out of food and we ran out of water. And this little dinky island took us 14 days to cross the darn thing. And we couldn't take a bath so you could uh, work your your collar like so. And man, <laughs> talk about smell. You know, because yeah, you get wet, you go into the river and you get wet and then you dry and you get wet. Go up those slippery mountains until we got to where these guys were, so our, our, our people were laying there waiting for us to come in and take them out. Mm -hmm. So that's what we had to do as an engineer also. So and Was that in the 11th Airborne? 11th Airborne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were, like I said, we were running out of water, but they had told us that we could uh, survive by cutting these long vines that were hanging off the trees. There was about a couple of inches across. You cut the bottom first, and then you cut the top as far as you can top, and then you lift up this vine, and that water would come out of there. You know, just it was so hollow in there, but it's full of water, and so we drank that. But when we finally ended up after 14 days, that we went ahead and, and, and bought these wounded guys and put them out there where, the, where they could take them out. Uh, we were, it was running toward the, 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 be the beach because we could see the ocean, you know. And we, the first thing we was thinking about taking a bath in the ocean. But in the meantime, here we're, we're uh, uh, walking along a brick, a brick, I mean a brook, a brook, a wa a, you know, running water. Oh, it was clear as could be. But you know what? Uh, up on top was a whole mess of dead Japs, a lot of dead Japs. And... Um, of course, the, the maggots had started already working. So we went and, 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 and started drinking water like an animal. We got down on our fours and started sucking this water. And then I sinked down at the bottom what looked like rice. It was maggots. So I kept on drinking anyway. And uh, everybody else was drinking. And I almost got shot by one of the guy, one of my own men, because I said, hey, you guys, there's maggots down in there. So they went and looked and seen it, and one of them started throwing up. But uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, that'll stick in my mind, too, because I thought, gee, I should have never said nothing, you know. How long were you in the Pacific? Uh, from um, March of um, 44 uh, until the end of the war. Yeah, it was, I, was, I was a guard for the, the place where the General MacArthur was staying. How long were you in the Pacific? Well, I was in there from, uh, like I said, from uh, March uh, when we went overseas, 27 days on the ocean from San Francisco to New Guinea from there until the end of the war. That would make it like what? Uh, March 44, uh, 40, no, wait a minute, 40, 44 till uh, the end of the war, which is 45. Uh, about a year and a half, maybe, yeah, being overseas, because we was, and, and they say I was in, uh, actually, I was in New Guinea, Leyte, Luzon, the little island, in Okinawa. Then we ended up in Japan, and that's uh, when we boarded a ship and um, come back to the States. And let's see what else have we got here that... Were you able to keep in touch with your family? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, email, they call it email. Yeah, that's what they called it. And uh, it was not, a, you could you could write it, but they take pictures of it. And your bride-to-be? Uh, yeah, you um, um, yeah, we back and forth. Oh, and that, that made me uh, survive, it helped me to survive because I was looking forward to this with all my heart and soul. And so that part, uh, I, I'm going to have to say this, uh, thanks to the war that I met her. If it hadn't been for the war, I told her this morning I'd have never met her. Mm -hmm. See, and this is how 
God works, you know, he's in charge, is what I say. He's in charge. And uh, war does have a, uh, war. I think war, if, you, if you're in it, uh, has a tendency to uh, uh, make you more aware of him, God. And uh, so, uh, consequently, we have a very religious life. And um, you were saying about my looks, you know, and, and part of it is because of that. Because we're not, uh, uh, we're not living a fast life or, or drinking or any of this. It's pretty, pretty religious, pretty, uh, what would you say it? Subdued life, low, low profile. Anyway, um, I see here, what else can I contribute towards this? But what else did you do when you were in the Pacific when you weren't actually in yeah. combat? Yeah, okay, we, we built a, this is another cute little story. Uh, we was in New Guinea, and they wanted to continue training us. Never lack, never let up on training. So they, had, being engineers, they had us build a jump tower. So we did. We knocked down huge teak wood trees. You know, expensive material there. And then we uh, we 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 uh, cut them up with a chain. We went, that's the first time I seen a chainsaw. This is a long blade chainsaw. And uh, oh, that thing worked beautiful. I mean, it cut through that tree like nobody's business. So we made our own timbers, huge, long timbers. And um, we put this thing together. And General Swing, com the vision commander, looked at it. And he liked it so well, he said, I want this to be shipped to wherever we go. And we'll put it up. Well, um, everybody is entitled to a mistake. The officer in charge said, "We're going to lower that tower down, and then uh, we're going we're to tie it. What they they don't call it rope; they call it hauser. That's a big two-inch rope." And he said, "Get all the men on it, and pull on it, and and lower that. So they're going to we're going to break uh, loose the two two uh, two legs over here, and then let it pivot on the other two." And then we're, it's going to supposed to go down because the truck's going to pull it over. No way. That bridge was, I mean, that tower was heavy. Because once it went beyond the point of no return, and then it started to fall and pick up speed. And that rope, oh, that rope went through a bunch of us. And they knocked a bunch of guys down and got the sergeant across the neck here and burnt him. And uh, I got away from that thing. I said, well, you're not going to hold it. I, I'm a private. And I know better, but this officer, I don't know, what was he thinking about? <laughs> but that tower come down, and boy, did it splatter. It was so heavy that it didn't have a chance. And, you know, that, that, that uh, it was on this tarmac, uh, tarmac, tarmac, rather. Uh, it hit that thing, and it splattered. Poom. So that was the end of that tower. But I'm saying, though, that officer should have tied another truck over here and then backed it up, you know, and, and we would have saved it. But. That's the way it goes. Another time, we, 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 the, the general said, as I understand it, uh, the commanders, division commanders said, I want a bridge across this river by the, by the ocean so we can get uh, more traffic to cross because we're being restricted to the movement of equipment and, and men. So being engineers, we went to cutting those coconut trees and we started to nail them together with big, long spikes. And one of the one of the men uh, bright, bright enough to say, well, we, you know, the the best way to uh, put these uh, steel um, spikes through these logs, big thick logs, is to shoot them with the with a 30 caliber um, bullet. It made a little dinky hole, and then that spike would go in it. So it did, and we built this uh, trestle. They call it trestle, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, it weighed tons and tons. So guess what happened? We started um, inching, it, inching it towards the, the river to see if we could put it up. No way. Before you knew it, that current got a hold of it, and it started pulling everybody into the water. And that thing got away. They're not in the ocean somewhere. And we had to cut the ropes, and we don't know what happened to it. But uh, again, I thought, gee, did nobody see the, the potential power of that water? And this huge thing, there was no way that we could hold it. So that was the end of that bridge. And to see what else was it. Did you go out into the civilian uh, community? Yes. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. We, they was all real happy to see us. Mm -hmm. 
Were they? Yeah, the people. And I remember one Christmas, and we was uh, getting pretty close to Manila. And the girls come out there, and uh, uh, they offered us tamales. Mm. Ooh, I thought to myself, <laughs> tamales. And so I, uh, I, we paid for them. They, I don't know if I forget what they charged. But they was not tamales like we know of. Mm. They was made of rice. Mm. And it was kind of gooey. And I, and I tried to eat one, and I, I couldn't eat it. And it was wrapped in banana leaves. And, of course, they thought it was, you know, good. But uh, some guys did eat them. But, uh, you know, there's a different uh, taste to, the, to, the, to what we was used to eating. Mm -hmm. So I was disappointed there because this was not a tamale like I knew. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, let's see here. What else? What else can I remember that uh, well, is of interest? Did you ever see any USO shows or have time? Yeah, in, in the States I okay. did. Yeah, we went and uh, made use of the USO with their coffee and donuts and, and, the, and, the, and the, um, uh, the material to write letters in. What do you, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, envelopes and mm -hmm. paper. And, and stationery. Um, what do you call it? Uh, stationery. Yeah, yeah. So we used to, I, with me and another guy used to go to. While you were overseas? No, this was, well, overseas we did have the Red Cross ladies um, uh, prepare some coffee and donuts when we was not in the area where there was any danger of the Japanese uh, shooting at you. And uh, let's see what, oh, yeah, yeah, there's uh, all kinds of bugs, insects. That's one thing I hated about New Guinea was that mosquitoes. I mean, they was big things. Yeah. And one night I woke up, I, we had a, a mosquito nets over our cots. This is when we was uh, training and bedwhacking, and uh, we was in pyramid tents. Um, I remember waking up, and I felt some weight on my foot. My foot, what could it be? And I looked, and there was a huge rat sitting on top of my foot. <laughs> and uh, I shook it like this, and boy, she took off. And how she ever got inside of my my mosquito net, I don't know, but it did take off. And well, I didn't pay no attention to that. I just went back to sleep. I used to sleep real good. One thing, another thing, I might tell you about my my tour in in, in the combat area. I had a heck of a time staying awake. I don't care where I was, I would fall asleep. And my t my turn uh, and the perimeter, we had uh, box holes where we would dig holes and then you'd take turns from, I, I had my, my guard duty was from 12 to 4. So I, there's no way that I could stay awake. So one day, uh, Mr. Mata, Robert Pri Private or PFC Mata was supposed to relieve me. So he came up there and he really chewed me out because I was asleep. <sighs> and he got mad. He said, you're supposed to stay awake, you know. They could have sneaked, they could have got you because we lost a lot of guys with the Japanese cutting their throats, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the way it was. And so um, I said, well, I, said, I just can't stay awake. It's just something about my mind, I guess, is mm -hmm. lazy or whatever, but I could not stay awake. But anyway, uh, that's another experience that I remember. That what was the food like? Well, it was uh, pretty good. It was uh, very nutritious. There was, uh, they had uh, breakfast, which was eggs and ham in little cans. And then there was, uh, uh, and uh, let's see, there, there was another at a noon, uh, supposed to be that, supposed to be a noon meal. Uh, it was also, sometimes it was beans and, and, uh, and Vienna sausage or, or uh-huh. MRIs? And, and yes. Okay, then at, at night was the best, because that's a lot of times it was spaghetti or chili. And, um, and, and she, yeah, and I really enjoyed the chili myself. But some of the guys didn't care for it, you know, they were not used to it, but I did. And so then I, um, I, I really enjoyed, would you believe it? I'm, I'm, I must have been nuts, but I really enjoyed my tour during mm. World War II, the time that I spent, because I saw a lot of things, a lot of things. And uh, you, uh, you, you know, you, you do acquire some wisdom, mm -hmm. I think, when you're involved in this uh, um, this thing of life and death, mm -hmm. 
And uh, we had, a, I remember some of the guys that, that didn't make it because some of them went crazy, you know. Like there was one guy, uh, I guess he thought he could get away with it, but he stripped down completely, no clothes, except for his, uh, for his uh, shoes. And he made a little, uh, he made a little crown of leaves and what have you, and he put it on his head. And so when they caught him, uh, he said, no, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a soldier, I'm a native. And so they knew right away that he was off. So uh, uh, they had a, the MPs came and, and took him away. And then another guy, that uh, same thing, he was, when the, when the uh, Jap uh, planes would fly over to drop bombs, oh, this guy would run and stick his head in the bush, and his, his, his tail would be up and... And I thought, gee, what's he hiding for? I mean, he's got his head in the bush, but his butt's up in the air there. Well, gee, well, there's no protection. But I used to ask him, oh, he says, Pachico says, I got a family. I got to take care of myself. I said, yeah, but look, you're not protected at all. You got just your head in the bush. And he said, yeah, well, but he had in his own mind that this was enough. Mm -hmm. And we had several of them that, uh, that cracked up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it was part of the. Part of the game, I guess, some of them could uh, could survive, and, and and it was just the opposite with me. Mm -hmm. I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you made really? it home to your uh, wife to be. I beg your pardon. You left and made it home, though. After that, or were you still? Oh, yeah. Well, you see, um, I come back home, and uh, I'll tell you the truth. I'm not, I'm not I'm not proud of this. But I was drunk for a week. <laughs> I got home <laughs> for a week. You went to California. I went back home to California, and uh, so then uh, then she wrote and uh, wanted to know when was when come down to see her. So I finally decided, hey, this is enough. So I got on the train in Riverbank, California, in January of 1946. Ended up in Kansas City. And I went out looking for a job, and of course there was plenty of jobs then. I found one at one place. Uh, this, this is a, a junkyard where there was, uh, well, there was big business then. Mm. Uh, and then uh, Armco Steel uh, uh, was was a, a big plant, a big a, a big basic steel plant. And so they was on strike, and some of the guys came to work where I was at at this junkyard. And uh, they was welders, and they could tell you use a torch and all that, so they hired them. But they say, hey, you ought to go up there and, and, and put in for this job at Armco Steel. This is a big outfit. So I did. Mm -hmm. This is 1946. And lo and behold, I got a job there. So I stayed with them for 38 years. Wow. In Kansas that, City? A big pardon? In Kansas City? Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And that provided a, a pension for me that I'm making use of right now. And my social security and the Harris, why well, we're just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, surviving, but uh, really not uh, nothing to brag about. But, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, this is the way we uh, ended up at. And the see, March is still pretty much winter in that part of the country, Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. But uh, we picked the day, uh, the second of March, for our wedding. And uh, oh, I got an interesting story I can tell you about this. But anyway. Uh, that would turn out to be a beautiful day, oh, warm, wow. the, we're in the middle of winter, mm -hmm. and I thought, this is a good omen. Good. So, yeah, so it, we, yeah, we've been married 58 years. And what brought you out to New Mexico? Well, I'll tell you what, it was, uh, the, w the winters are kind of severe mm -hmm. in that part of the country. Not all of them, but some of them are, wow, some of them get pretty, mm -hmm. pretty mean. So uh, she said, I'm, I'm getting tired of this, this weather out here. The humidity is horrible in the summertime, and I struggled with that thing for 30, 40 years, uh, you know, the humidity. Mm -hmm. uh, there was days when I had to take a bath three times when I was home on account of the humidity. You feel sticky. And so anyway, we decided that we go to New Mexico because uh, we, uh, we heard that uh, there's sunshine 365 days a year. So we done it. I mean, we always had a big yard sale, and then after that we had an auction. And after that, we bought a, a trailer, a 16 foot by eight, mm -hmm. homemade, mm -hmm. and we hauled most of the stuff in it. You know, it's a pretty good sized trailer. Paid $1,300 for it. So when I come to, when we come to uh, Macintosh, 
um, I sold it for the same price. So we we got moved for nothing, you might say. So that was another another blessing. And uh, the reason for that for that, that that was the reason for moving to to New Mexico. We thought mm -hmm. about the weather being nice out here. Well, when we was coming in on November the 9th of 1990, uh, there was six inches of snow where, where we had bought this property, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said to Mary, let's go back to you, Wiz. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, I was really delighted with, um, with New Mexico. We have grown to really love the place, you know. Mm -hmm. And now that I belong to the American, po American Legion Post, 22, I, I do all I can you know, to, to see why I, I, I have an idea that I would like to help the, the kids that are in trouble. Mm -hmm. I would like to. And that means that model airplanes or model boats, remote control. Mm -hmm. And um, I talk to them about it. And so uh, I'm looking forward to doing that sooner or later to see how it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Pacheco, is this you yep. in the military? Yep. When you were a youngin'? When I was a youngin'. Uh, I was just a pup then. Where were you then? Uh, the, the, this was taken in, in um, I think this was taken in the Philippines. Yeah, this was taken in the Philippines. Um, this was taken in Manila after the Japs had pulled out. Were they? We was on furlough. Or, or, oh. Yeah, this is a little before the... MPs was going, uh, driving all over the Manila with loudspeakers. Everybody return to your, to your post, to your, to your area, because they had dropped the bomb and we was going to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. So this is, I took this picture about that time. And you were how old then? Uh, 23, 22, 23, somewhere around there. Yeah. Didn't see any ribbons or no. Rank, were you there? No, I mean, uh, when I, I remember putting on the shirt and my cap, and, and I, the only thing was my patch. But I was in a hurry to get the, 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 the manila. To... I see some ribbons over on the next. Okay, uh, the ribbons Picture. are next. Oh, I am proud of these. I'm really proud of my, of my ribbons. That's a nice, uh -huh. a lot of them. Oh, yeah. Can you just say real quick what well, one of them are? Well, the one of this is a good conduct. And I'll have to see if I can do this oh. this way. I don't know, but uh, this is, oh, boy, That's I tell you what, I need my glasses. Oh, I need my airborne. glasses. Airborne. You have an airborne patch? Yeah, I have my airborne patch. And your jump patch? Yeah, it's my, my wings. I'm proud of my wings. Uh, so I have to do this. I'm sorry. What rank did you? PFC. PFC. Yeah, and, that, and that's about all they had for the demolition man. They, I don't, they couldn't. I don't think they could have gone and given us any more. But uh, Lynn Rose, Harold Lynn Rose, the guy, the last guy that I saw up there, left the, mm -hmm. had the same thing. He was the same thing. Okay, uh, this one here is uh, World War II medal, and this one here is the American campaign, and this one here is the South Southwest. Uh, Asian Pacific campaign and uh, three three landings that we made. And this is the engineers and this is the liberation of the Philippines. And this is 50 year anniversary. And this oh, is the 50 year anniversary of, uh, of the war of the yeah of World War Two. World War Two. And uh, and this is uh, I was an expert rifleman and this is part of it right there. And let's see what else. Huh? Your stripes? My stripes for PFC. Yeah. And I see my and this is what I'm proud of, my wings. Yeah. Does that mean you jumped so many times? Yeah, yeah, you had to jump. I think it was three times and uh, make sure that you've done everything right. And did they give this to you at your fifty year medal at the Yeah, they no, this was sent to us. Okay. Yeah, this was sent to us. And so uh, let's see here. Well that's it. Uh no, it's not too much, but it's it's it's, it's lovely. Enough. It's a really nice put yeah. together plaque. Yeah. Well, thank you, yeah. Mr. Pacheco, yeah. for your well, time. Sure. Yeah. Well, you're quite welcome. Is there anything I was really, else? I was really happy to. Beg your pardon. Is there anything else you'd like to add? <sighs> no, no. Happy to well, I I tell you what. We had to be kind to the uh, veterans of World War II. Mm -hmm. 
because it was to them that we're able to enjoy what we're enjoying now. That's right. And um, I tell you what, uh, I was going to bring a, 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 a four sheet and I forgot it, but I was going to bring it. But I give it to them already and they said, no, we cannot use it because it talks against the politicians. Oh. So they said, this is a conflict of interest, but I was going to bring it anyway to see if you, if you folks could do something with it, you know. But it tells about uh, uh, Bob, the veteran, who went to war, and uh, he's now they're dying off, and he talks about the experience, and so people laugh at him, but uh, uh, the veterans know where he speaks of. And uh, so uh, I, I should have brought it, but I didn't. Unless I can mail it to you if you think you'd be interested in seeing this. But I remembered them. My tour in Japan was interesting. And um, uh, the, the Japanese had a, a custom where men and women bathed together. And that was interesting. Nobody thought nothing about it. And uh, let's see what else. Oh, and the weapons and explosives in Japan. And you should have seen the pile of rifles. I'd say the pile was like 20 foot tall and about uh, 